Good morning. The title of my presentation this morning is clearly inspired by the theme of the conference, Communication Across Borders. I've become increasingly intrigued by the notion of border crossing, boundary crossing, not just physical borders and boundaries, but invisible, metaphorical ones, those that can block communication between different people. And it got me thinking about bridges, bridges which are not always, of course, physically crossing borders, but metaphorically connecting people, languages, knowledges, communities, ideas, disciplines, etc. I thought I'd start by showing you a few physical bridges. This is the Millennium Bridge. It's known, it was known as the Wobbly Bridge because it wasn't um, sturdy when it was first opened and it was wobbling when people were walking on it. So it had to be reinforced. The bridge was a bit wobbly, shaky. Here we have an inspirational, exciting bridge um, that happens to be in Graz, where the, loca the location for the European Centre for Modern Languages that I'll be talking about later on. And some bridges, of course, are built on very solid foundations, like this one here from 1546, the Alte Brücke in Saarbrücken, which I wish I could see and visit these days. Unfortunately, as Isaac Newton said, we build too many walls and not enough bridges. So I, in this talk, want to explore three perspectives on bridges across borders. First of all, pedagogy for autonomy is a bridge between learners and language learning. Multilingual education as a bridge between languages, cultures and communities. And thirdly, and probably briefly, language teacher associations as bridges between all language teachers. And it's quite ambitious, so I may hurry through some bits. Um, starting with the first one though, the bridge between learners and language learning, we may wonder why we need a bridge um, and how we build it. The bridge, what kind of border is it crossing? What obstacles are there between learners and the goal of language learning? It may be motivation. It may be not knowing how to learn. So let's have a think about it. Language is a bridge that can take you anywhere in the world, we say. And we say that to our students as well. It's something that really motivates all of us here. That's why we're engaged in language education. Contact with people, places, cultures. But is it the motivation for everyone? I'm going to say a little bit about some research I did about 20 years ago now. It was a two-year... Um, ethnographic study of language learners in a comprehensive school in the north of England. Um, the, the, the focus was on learners' voices and I wanted to know what language learning was like through the eyes of 13 to 15 year olds in this northern town. They were learning French or German. And what I found was um, for most of them, they couldn't really see the point. So, for example, everyone speaks English, don't they? Says Jimmy. Jody, all the French people, everybody talk English. It's good to learn a language. You don't need it really. These two are actually motivated learners through my research. Um, and, you know, good learners. They, they knew how to learn. Carl, this was rather sad. You're not exactly like going to go working over there, are you? Not like us. Well, I don't think we will anyway. So he's saying, you know, it's not for us. When am I going to go and when am I going to use it? What's the point for me? The school was in a very working class area. So they didn't really know people who went abroad to, 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 to work or worked in international contexts. So it didn't really make much sense to them. 
they really wanted to find the purpose of language learning. Jimmy say reports on when he once felt he was using his language, his German it was. We were doing this thing for the university and we had to do either a cartoon strip or a letter. We had this like Star Trek um, type cartoon um, and it got put in the university. So I felt I was really using it. It had to be good so people could understand it. And that was the first time I ever thought I was really using my language and not just doing it for the sake of it. So he'd been learning German for two years by this point. And this was the first time when he had a real audience um, in this festival of languages that I'd organised actually in the university. And, you know, he could see the point. It's to communicate um, authentic authenticity. He wanted to apply the learning. He wanted to use what he was learning in an authentic way. Connections came through very strongly in the research. They wanted to connect with people in other countries. And remember, this was 20 years ago. I asked the groups to consider what they thought a languages classroom might look like in 50 years. Remember, we're nearly halfway through to those 50 years now. Um, so, you know, they weren't used to computers and things. And they wanted German switchboard displaying information. Um, virtual realities will help you go to Germany. A helicopter to take them to, I think, on the, on the school roof and they could just go off and come back again. We don't have that, I'm afraid. Um, immediate phone-to-phone -phone contact. You know, all of these things are possible now. The computers. Even this, one of my favourites. Transporter which whisks you off to anywhere in the world, like Star Trek. I think Jimmy was in that group. So, you know, yes, we can practice our language, we get into this, we press a button, and then we're suddenly whisked off to France or to Germany, where we can use it with real people. Sometime um, later, I was invited by the Secretary of State for Education to lead on a, a diploma, a new qualification for 14 to 19 year olds, <clears throat> the Diploma in Languages and International Communication. And as part of that, I mean, the, the, the Secretary of State wanted more children to learn, want to learn languages, to be motivated and to continue to learn languages beyond the age when they were allowed to give it up, which was 16 in those days. And we did a lot of research, learner perspectives, students in schools, um, as well as in universities, university lecturers, school teachers, employers, etc. Surveys, interviews. And some of the learner perspectives, I thought I'd just highlight a few things. Again, it's coming up, contexts of interest to them. Something that made language learning real, real tasks for them contact with native speakers, you can see visits abroad, emails. Um, what makes it real? Business language, culture of the target language community, and also engaging active learning, active interactive lessons. Um, they, they wanted also to know how well they're doing, how well they're progressing, so that they could decide what they needed to do next. They wanted to be able to have some sort of control and responsibility for their learning, which is actually relates very closely to self-determination theory, theories that were developed by DC and Ryan in the States in the 1970s and still applied. And they argued that for intrinsic motivation to flourish, three basic universal psychological needs need to be fulfilled. Competence, they needed to be able to do the work, successfully, not too easy, not too hard. They needed, it, relatedness was the second psychological need. They need to be able to relate to the work. They also need to relate to people as they're doing it. And thirdly, interestingly, autonomy. And we're talking about pedagogy for autonomy now, because I found that by enabling my, my own learners when I was a teacher, 
decades ago in schools uh, with large heterogeneous classes, all kinds of capabilities in the class. The only way I could cater for them all so that they could all be doing something that was relevant to them, um, that, that they could be competent in, was by teaching them how to make choices about what they did, choosing tasks at different levels, different skills, different, co different contents, um, maybe all around a theme so it was all linked. But this was a way in which I managed to really help those learners to be much more successful than they'd been before. And of course, what I was doing, and I didn't know anything about learner autonomy, it was before I worked in the university, was giving them opportunities to take control of their learning, which is a definition of learner autonomy. But I had to help them to be autonomous. I had to teach them how to make choices, etc. Autonomy then was a theme actually that came up in the diploma research as well, around uh, from the teachers, from higher education, from employers. They wanted people to be self, to be competent self-managers, basically, to be able to make decisions, to be able to, 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 to solve problems. It crops up over and over again um, when the ECML, the European Centre for Modern Languages, does its survey of its member states to inform priorities for future projects, autonomous learning, as well as interestingly plurilingual um, and intercultural and inclusive approaches. But autonomous learning crops up over and over again. I just want to um, also show you that in the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages, the, the, in, in the pedagogical part there, talks about raising the learner's awareness of the present state of knowledge, self-setting feasible and worthwhile objectives, selection of materials, self-assessment, etc. So all around learners being able to take greater responsibility and control over their learning and developing that capacity. Uh, very briefly, I just wanted to show you this because I, I was invited to speak um, to an audience in, in Norway last year, it was actually obviously online, on creativity because it featured in their new curriculum. And when I looked at the curriculum, not only in this section but elsewhere, there, were, there was clearly um, what they were wanting was for, for learners to be able to um, do things for themselves, to be able to explore, to, to be able to engage themselves, to ask questions, not just answer, to create, um, to solve problems. So all of these things, it's very rare in a curriculum that you actually find the words autonomy or learner autonomy, but it's usually there. We want our learners, just like parents want their learners, uh, want their children to be able to thrive without them, when they leave home. This is what we want in education as well. It's preparing lifelong learners. So this is um, really a, sort of a way of uh, that, that, that colleagues and I in the Europal project, European Pedagogy for Autonomous Learning, some years ago, tried to, def to, to explore what it meant. Um, and really we talked about self-management opportunities to take responsibility for different aspects of their learning. So the flexible learning that I've been doing in schools, but project learning, etc. But also for that to work, we had to nurture the internal factors that helped them to take responsibility and control. So they had to learn how to learn how self-regulation rather than self-management here, development of strategies, critical thinking, all of these things. We need to nurture those things um, in order to build that bridge to enable them to become autonomous and motivated learners of languages. This is very close, of course, to the original definitions. Henri Olek in France is his seminal work for the Council of Europe 
where he talked about la prise en charge de l'apprentissage, taking charge of their learning, or, or as Phil Benson puts it, the ability to take control of their learning, control over their learning management, the, the management of how they're learning, but also the cognitive processes and learning content. And we have to remember that we need to nurture that because <laughs> very often our learners have forgotten how to learn because they've been told exactly what to do in schools. Very often we find we find this um, you know, when, when children have been in a secondary school in the UK for a while, I can remember, you know, that they were already saying, oh, I've you know, reached the bottom of my page, what do I do next? Um, you know, whereas in primary schools, they were very, very engaged and active in their learning. So we need to teach them how to learn very often. Back to John here, um, you know, the teacher says, just go home and learn it. But the teachers need to help you and give you tips for revising, having a revision lesson where you go over things you've done, etc. So the teacher's role in learning started to be explored um, in the mid-90s much more as well. And, you know, we, there was, for example, the, the World Congress, the Applied Linguistics uh, in, International Association in Singapore. Um, I convened a symposium there for the Scientific Commission on Learner Autonomy and Language Learning, where we looked at learner and teacher autonomy. Teacher autonomy had been explored for a few years. So, you know, the interest in the teacher in, in, in de developing learner autonomy. And the Europal project that I mentioned earlier as well, that was also in the 2000s. Um, and of course, what, um, Teachers have to do, just like learners, in order to be able to do this is, is to overcome constraints. There are always reasons why people say, we can't let our children make decisions. Um, and so, you know, these have been analysed in this pedagogy for autonomy as well. What are the constraints? Well, there are external ones. Yes, there are exams. There's a curriculum then maybe prescribed pedagogies. Um, the timetable constraints very often, or they don't have resources. So a number of constraints where, when I've done workshops with teachers around learner autonomy, the first thing they say is, but we can't do that with my class. And I'm fortunately able to say, but I had constraints. We've just got a new national curriculum. We've just had new inspections introduced. Um, and, and, you know, people were stopping developing autonomy in the classroom and going back to very traditional approaches. But actually, I carried on um, because you can find ways of dealing with these constraints. But there are also internal constraints, you know, beliefs of learners and teachers about their roles. You know, the teachers in my research that I talked about earlier, learners who were, you know, kind of able to be motivated and take some control. If you ask them, you know, what what do you need to do to, to do better? They, they would say, oh, I need to do this, or I should do this, or I am doing this. Those that weren't motivated or very autonomous would say, well, the teacher should make us do this. Yeah, so, you know, the learners and teachers' beliefs really, really play a very important part. Um, interestingly, in terms of constraints, um, just recently uh, in the Times Higher Education, uh, the magazine that comes out um, now every two weeks, headline, self-directed learning is being pushed out of the picture through COVID. Now you would imagine that um, the use of technology uh, for online learning, which we've been doing now for 18 months or so, would actually enable our students to be more autonomous. But it hasn't in many cases, because what has happened is in the hurry to, to move to online learning, um, that people have put content onto, onto, onto um, Blackboard or whatever environment you use 
for the students to do. And what this report was saying, in the heady rush to extol the virtues of the asynchronous learning, we're watering down the main elements of students' experience. And here we have establishing goals, resources, adopting and executing learning activities, monitoring, evaluating their performance, reassessing learning strategies. So the whole um, issue of COVID and this rush is, has been a constraint on teachers too. And unfortunately, what we find, and with my, in my research with those students, those, some of those students, like the ones I mentioned, were motivated, um, despite the fact that they didn't know, uh, you know why they were learning the language. They were still motivated and very capable of making good decisions they were also in a school where there was flexible learning and very, very using it very effectively. When I went back to them, they, um, when they were 15 and they'd started to get ready for exams, they were suddenly very demotivated. They said, but we can't do all of the things that we used to anymore um, because all we do now is teacher gives us things to practice and we're just focusing on the exam now. So... They'd had their autonomy removed. And as a conclusion, um, I've, I've written that intrinsic motivation can be stifled if a person isn't allowed to be actively self-determining. This is nothing new when we think back to DC and Ryan. But this is, it's the process of self-determination itself which stimulates intrinsic motivation. The argument has been that a learner needs to be motivated in order to be autonomous because they won't do it for themselves if they're not motivated. What I found in my teaching, what I found in the research, was that by handing over gradually some control, you were building a bridge for them understanding what they were doing, why they were doing it, etc. And you were developing motivation. So the chicken and egg question of what comes first, motivation or autonomy, I, I rever found it reversed. They don't need to be motivated to be autonomous, but being autonomous can stimulate the motivation. And because of those students um, who had uh, sadly become quite demotivated before their exams, and actually their exam results were a great disappointment, I did a, this article later on reflecting back on that and talking about their fragile learning identities. They had a learner identity. They knew what learners were, were doing and why they were learning languages in the end. Um, but it was broken. It was shattered when the teacher took over control. And you can see the, the blue, the recommendation in blue is to protect their learning identities as learners responsible for their learning by dealing with external constraints such as exams, not through increasing teacher control, but by engaging their learners' voices to find collaborative negotiated solutions. And this is how we build uh, a pedagogy for autonomy. We build a bridge for the learners. And it, just to finish with the Europe, this section really with the Europal definition where we came up with a definition of learner autonomy uh, and teacher autonomy, which was the same. So the competence, and competence is important, it needs to be developed. To develop as a self-determined, socially responsible and critically aware participant in and beyond educational environments, within a vision of education as personal and interpersonal empowerment and social transformation. And in order to do that, we need to find the spaces for manoeuvre through the constraints. And I'll just show you very briefly a tool that we, uh, that, that we developed, um, a whole range of these, but people can develop their own. And it's bridging between what they know is the ideal, that the learner should be able to become more autonomous. I wish I could give them more opportunities for decision making. This is my ideal. What's the reality, though? I don't, because I've got to cover the syllabus, etc. And then getting them to reflect on 
Well, if you can't just jump straight away into your ideal, what can you do? And this is an example of how they can find ways of moving, finding the spaces for manoeuvre. So they could just do it in, before tests, ask them to identify their own difficulties and let them choose what to do according to their needs, or negotiating their homework activities, etc. So this is another bridge between the teacher's ideal and the reality that they can actually move towards their ideal along this bridge. And the teachers are finding their own autonomy uh, by refusing to be constrained by the constraints, refusing to be disempowered. Um, I, I don't really have much time for this, but I just wanted to end to this bit by saying it is possible. Um, we see wonderful examples of autonomous and creative activity in supplementary schools as well, for example, which are those schools which are not even usually taught by professional teachers. They're run by communities, um, language communities, to en enable their children to um, continue to learn the lang about the lang their languages and about the cultures. And I work very closely with some of these, and I'll mention this later on. Um, but, you know, here we've got examples, so Vali Lytra's uh, article there, where this created, that the, the, the children worked together collaboratively, but making decisions. Autonomy isn't about individualism at all. It's about collaborating to be able to find your place in the learning process as well. Um, and transforming a, a, a folk song or a children's song by using a range of semiotic resources, so clapping or whistling or various sorts of things, how they could adapt it and make it their own. Similar with the next point there, which I won't go into, but the, the last point there, the, the, the photographs and paintings, this um, is, is, is the Albanian school that were doing this, the, the Shpresa, which means hope in, in Albanian. And um, this was through lockdown and some research I did, uh, looking at social media at the supplementary schools to see how they were coping in lockdown. And what they were doing, this one example here was one of many, um, and they were asking the children to find a painting or find an old photo, an old painting or a photo, and to replicate it themselves by finding clothes that were similar, making poses that were similar to the painting, and taking a photo and uploading that next to the original and describing it and also finding out about who the original painter was, etc. But this was one place here where autonomy, where control was handed over to the learners. And there were very young learners doing this. Um, and it was a way of, you know, keeping them away, not spending all the time on, with technology, but actually doing some other things as well. And it, just wonderful, wonderful. It shows the potential. And I think these examples from some of our linguistic communities in our super diverse linguistic multilingual um, environment um, is a good link. It's a good bridge itself to uh, this theme of multilingual education as a bridge between languages, cultures and communities. Um, and I'm going to do this fairly quickly, I think. Uh, I will be drawing on... Um, the uh, work that I do with the U uh, European Centre for Modern Languages. This is a training and consultancy activity that's been running since 2016, I think it was, uh, 2015 actually. Um, and uh, it's uh, co-funded by the Council of Europe and uh, the, Euro uh, the European Commission. So it's a collaboration there as well. I don't know if I mentioned, but the European Centre for Modern Languages is actually part of the Council of Europe, even though it's located in Graz. 
And this training and consultancy, we, we, we do workshops for teachers and uh, policy makers and head teachers in European countries. Um, and we, we're a team of eight people um, uh, from various countries and we, we uh, engage them in activities that help them to think about how they can uh, support the, the, the linguistically diverse classes that they find themselves increasingly teaching in. And we demonstrate um, through interactive uh, activities with the, with the participants in the workshops how they can use resources from the European Centre for Modern Languages. Now, we've seen um, a number of gaps, and I'm talking about gaps rather than borders, um, but I, I was asked to write an article about this earlier short article for the Association for Language Learning. Um, and this is... Um, what we identify a number of gaps, and... This was already there, we knew about it, and this is what inspired the development of, of the Supporting Multilingual Classrooms um, workshops. Um, but we do see the gaps still emerging in the workshops as well. So the gaps between all of the languages and language varieties that make up a learner's language repertoire. Um, you know, the, and, and I'll talk more about this in, in the, the next slides. This is just an overview. But, you know, some of the languages that a child speaks may not be valued as much as others, for example, but, or they're seen as separate entities. Gaps between different language classrooms, um, you know, not only between French, German, Spanish, Chinese classrooms, um, where the teachers might keep their resources to themselves because they're competing for students. Um, and that's what it was like when I was a head of department anyway in London um, schools. Um, but also between the modern languages and the English teachers in England or the French teachers in France, not just the French as a second language, but those teaching French as, as, as the language of the, in, the, in the curriculum. Um, so, you know, but between all of these, and then if we have community language classes as well, they're all working separate. So there are these gaps that need to be bridged. Gaps between the everyday language spoken by learners and the specialist language of education. I'll say something about that. Um, thinking about teachers from other disciplines of maths or history or whatever, and their awareness of themselves and their role in teaching their subject, um, but not their role in helping their students to develop the language of their subject. And if they have students there who uh, you know, have the language of schooling as not as their home language, then that's one issue, but actually many children come from backgrounds where they're not used to the language of schooling. And then gaps between teachers' beliefs about multilingualism and the scholarship that exists and the research. So let's have a look, first of all, and this is another gap actually that I, I didn't just mention, but um, this was a, a, a poster that was reported in the newspapers um, just after Brexit. Um, and this was, had been put up in a block of flats which had people from all different backgrounds, basically saying, we don't tolerate people speaking other languages than English in these flats. Um, you, I, I won't give it any more space than that, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's extremely offensive. And there was, a, there was clearly, um, after Brexit, um, and actually building up to Brexit, there was an increase in violence and hostility towards people speaking other languages um, on buses or on the streets or whatever. So, you know, the gap between the monolinguals and the people who are multi plurilingual, um, you know, was kind of growing. And how do we help our monolingual um, inhabitants, uh, uh, citizens, to to be open to this multilingualism, which in fact is wonderful. Um, after all, bilingual is better. This uh, 
That's from Spanglish Baby. For many bilingual households, language is the bridge to the essence of who we are and to the heart of our heritage. It's very, very important to individuals. This uh, was uh, an interactive exhibition I developed um, and which I still use sometimes for, for festivals, uh, where children or adults would fill in various kinds of cards. Um, my favourite language is, is the easiest one. Some would, would say learning and knowing another language made a difference when and complete it. But just this one example, my favourite language is Telugu because it's my mother tongue. My whole family speaks it. Knowing Telugu makes me feel special, different and unique. It's a part of that child's identity. And I, most people in schools wouldn't even know that Telugu was such a, a rich um, Indian language um, with a very, very long history. But it's very important to, uh, to this child. This is an activity which you may have seen, and we use this in our workshops as well, um, where we give people a body outline, say any language, you don't have to be proficient in them all, that means something to you and put it somewhere in your body. Um, and they do that, and it actually helps them to reflect on their own um, plurilingualism. So this was a, a child, part of the, one of the uh, people in the project, um, did this with some children in southern Germany, um, whose languages there you can see are Russian, German, English, Turkish and French. And um, she says, you know, Deutsch, ja? ich denke und ich uh, rede auf Deutsch meistens. So she usually thinks, as she thinks and speaks sometimes, usually in German. Um, but Muttersprache is the blue. That's my mother tongue. Ich fühle mich zum Russischen emotional verbunden. And the teachers probably didn't even know that Russian was her mother tongue, because that's what happens very often in schools. We don't know much about what they do outside school and that they go to those supplementary schools um, if they exist. But there's, she says, I feel an emotional connection to Russian. Um, and then, of course, English is very often hands and feet, tools, help you to move around. She's got a French wrist there, which says, it's, uh, I learned it in school, but I don't have much connection. And the green, friends, my neighbourhood. So she feels Turkish is part of her identity now because of her friends who speak Turkish, which again just shows how languages can really break down barriers if we give them the chance. Um, you'll find um, uh, in, on the Maladive uh, website, on the ECML website, um, the project which developed a number of tools like this and different ways of, uh, of, of uh, looking uh, visually and developing visually a, a picture of, of, of uh, um, a language repertoire. So another bridge here then is the bridge between languages and this is drawing on the linguistic repertoires, plurilingual pedagogies as bridges between languages. And for this we very often draw on the FREPA uh, project and ECML. Again, I won't say much about it. You can go and look at the website. But it's descriptors for plurilingual and intercultural competencies. And the types of activity they do, uh, and that we do with participants in our workshops as well, is this. So people, children or adults, I mean, this will be older students probably, uh, put into groups with um, eight or nine different uh, sentences or statements that are all saying the same thing but in different languages. And what they're asked to do is to put that into the language of schooling or into their home language. Um, and of course, there's a whole range of languages that you can use uh, to make this possible. But um, they, they, they reconstruct the, test, uh, the text. And usually they're very successful in, in that. I mean, what that text actually is, is um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
Um, and then, you know, so that, that's a task they do. And then we ask them to reflect on it, um, as, I'll, as I'll come to in a minute. Um, this is another example. Um, Little Red Riding Hood, and you've got that, the same sentence, oh, what big ears, eyes, um, uh, teeth you've got um, in, in, in French, German, Finnish and Italian. And through um, tools to support it, they're able to identify the words for ears and eyes, etc. in those languages. And what it what they have to do is 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 work it out, and it's quite possible even with Finnish, um, which uh, I don't know much about, to to identify it because you look at what it, the repetition around it. So these kinds of activities with children, and especially you know if you've got with these activities, and particularly ones like the other one, and there are some simple ones as well. They're not all about the universal. Uh, rights, Declaration of Human Rights, but um, if you've got children in there who speak that language, then suddenly they are, a, you know, they are a resource for other people. They can really contribute to the activities. Um, and sorry, I didn't mean to do that. But what um, what we ask them to do um, is to then reflect on how they did the activity, and. You know, what kind of knowledge did they use and it's, or develop? And it's, you know, they, they, then about strategies that can be used to understand that there's no word-for-word -word equivalence between different languages. What skills did they develop? Observation, analysis, comparing languages, making educated guesses, looking at similarities and differences. Uh, using knowledge of one language to understand another language. And in terms of attitudes, the motivation to look at other languages, to compare them, um, openness to the diversity of languages, um, ability to deal with what is new or what is strange, and therefore developing confidence. So activities like this help us to activate our plurilingual resources um, in order to be able to learn something new. Um, and, and as the Common European Framework says, plurilinguals have a single interrelated repertoire that they combine with their general competences and various strategies in order to accomplish tasks. What I see, um, and when I reflect on that, and I reflect back to my own teaching where um, I, uh, I gave all students opportunities to learn not only French and German, but also Greek and Turkish, which were very common languages amongst the communities in the school. Um, and um, they, 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 they made use of this comparison and, and through developing activities like this one. Um, and what I've realised recently, as you can see there in an article with Phil Benson, that where we were reflecting on autonomy in the age of multilingualism, um, that actually it's, it's learner autonomy as well. It's not just ch making choices from a range of teaching resources, but opportunities to learn how to utilise their own internal plurilingual resources through learning to reflect on, analyse, hypothesise, test, and develop confidence and competence. Unfortunately, um, when we ask uh, teachers in our workshops um, to, uh, to think about which languages that there are in their local area and which languages can be seen or heard in their school, they very often say, uh, but we don't allow them to use their home languages at school at all. Um, you know, it's not it's not forbidden. I, some say, well, they do in the playground. Some of them say, well, I try and say hello to them in different languages. But generally, there's a there's a sort of belief, a myth that I, that they need to leave that language outside the classroom, the home language, in order to learn German in Germany to access the curriculum. Um, and this is what the teachers believes, and this is one of those 
gaps, as I identify, between what the teachers believe that sounds quite commonsensical. You know, just use this one language and you'll, you'll master it. Um, but actually all of the research says otherwise, and, and that actually we can draw on our plurilingual resources to support um, our, our, our development and development of the language of schooling as well. So it's also a bridge to, and to, to learning the language of schooling. So on the last slide, I also wanted to point out that I had finally found a bridge between my two research areas of learner autonomy and multilingual education. Um, I, I, I could show you more um, projects from the European Centre for Modern Languages that are about developing the, the language of instruction or language of schooling, as they call it in the Council of Europe, um, and ways of scaffolding that. There's some great projects there. And also about whole school um, strategies, uh, whole school uh, policies for multilingual education, which very often um, bring in parents and bring in the local community and therefore act as a bridge between the school, the formal and out of school learning, which is another area that learner autonomy has been engaging with, obviously, that I didn't have time to talk about. But the links between what's learned in the school and out of school um, and including in those supplementary schools that I talked about. But I'd just like to finish really this section now with one other bridge. And this is about um, building bridges. If you remember back to that poster I showed you, how do we bridge, um, make a bridge between different linguistic communities so that they enjoy the multilingualism rather than fearing it and having suspicions about it. As you can see here, Sprache baut Brücken. And I found this myself, um, as I just mentioned earlier, in, in the last school I taught in, in London, I introduced a curriculum where everyone could learn French, German, Greek and Turkish. And the monolingual English children, when they were given then a choice of which one they were going to continue with, often chose Greek and Turkish or Turkish rather than French and German. And when I asked them why and did some research, they said, because we can practice it with our friends and because we hear it in our neighbourhood. So the opportunity, this was very innovative in the 1980s, uh, the opportunity to learn um, the language of their friends that normally would be left outside the school, but actually to learn it opened their eyes and very often those children then chose to study a second foreign language the following year hard you know which was, was wasn't much heard of so i always argue that if you give them an opportunity to learn a language of the community um, that actually it will help them to understand the purpose of language learning. It's a bridge to that authentic learning and will help them to understand why they might want to learn French or German. But I just want to uh, give another example of this very briefly. Uh, this is quite old, but I love this. So it's a conversation between five-year-old plurilinguals. Clearly, they sometimes get their languages and cultures mixed up, but they're all talking about when they use the different languages. What's interesting to me is, is Sabina at the end, who says, I talked to the Chinese in English and I spoke to um, the author, I, was a friend of mine, and, and said, can you tell me about Sabina? Why does she talk to the Chinese in English? Um, and she says, well, she doesn't. She, she just speaks English. But um, she wanted to engage in the conversation and therefore wanted to comment, which again, um, reflected experiences that I had in schools with the kind of language awareness activities that I showed you earlier with FREPA. Um, but what I want to you know, just talk about, and this is an article that I, I wrote for Thomas's brilliant journal um, just last year, because I see that um, <laughs> I've been exploring how we bring the different communities, uh, the different linguistic communities together 
um, and, and, and how that can help to change people's mindsets. Our um, supporting multilingual classroom workshops, um, the participants very often say in their evaluations, we, we shifted mindsets, we changed, you know, we changed our perspective completely, you know, that we thought multi that having these languages was a problem when actually we realised it's a resource for everybody. Um, so what I've been doing is bringing the supplementary schools together, not just with themselves, but with different uh, supplementary schools, but actually finding ways of bringing them together with the monolingual communities as well, as a way, and, and I see them as spaces of hope, um, and, and um, Sprisse itself means hope, as I said, for a more inclusive world, uh, a mo more socially just world. And I just wanted to mention that one of the things that uh, I've done in the past, and this was when I was working at Sheffield University, was to have multilingual festivals in the city centre, in public spaces. Um, and the, the, the kind of exhibition I showed you, the, 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 the card that the girl had filled, uh, that the child had filled in about why, what her favourite language was, um, that, you know, that exhibition would be running and we would also have communities coming in doing what they were doing. And here we've got the Spanish community, which are largely from South America, uh, the Chinese and the Oromo community um, from um, East Africa. And uh, it's, it's the conversations that emerge from all of this is uh, just amazing. Um, I'd love to say more, but I, I am organising one of these in the university next next year as well, because I think that you know we 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 are the most diverse university in the country, uh, University of Westminster, uh, right in the centre of London, but no one ever talks about languages, and so I'm about to start a survey on that. But you know, so the idea of these activities as a bridge between languages and communities um, is just something that really struck me when I was thinking about my presentation. I'll just finish this with um, quoting from the Council of Europe as a kind of summary, because what they say themselves is plurilingual education promotes an awareness of why and how one learns the languages one's chosen, an awareness of and the ability to use transferable skills in language learning, an ability to perceive and mediate the relationships which exist among language and cultures, and a global integrated approach to language education in the curriculum. As you can, you know, I've been able to just demonstrate very, very briefly um, how we uh, develop these uh, ideas in, in, in our workshops. Um, but also, it also promotes a respect for the plurilingualism of others and the value of languages and varieties, irrespective of their perceived status in society. We know that French and German and English are seen as important languages. Um, and unfortunately, many, you know, the Albanian community, people think that Albanian is pointless, really. Um, so, you know, this builds their understanding that it's a huge value to the, to the individual emotionally as well and part of their identity. It brings also a respect for the cultures embodied in languages and the cultural identities of others. So finally, in the last couple of minutes, I would just like to touch on, I did say it would be brief, um, language teacher networks as bridges between all language teachers. The uh, Fédération Internationale des Professeurs de Langue Vivante is a federation of language teacher associations, national ones, multilingual ones, and uh, international unilingual ones. So IDFAL, for example, International Deutsch, uh, Lira Verband is, 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 um, is a member of FIPLV, for example. And um, what we try to do in FIPLV is to encourage language teachers from different languages to collaborate. Um, FIPLV has existed since 1931 and it's an NGO of UNESCO and the Council of Europe. 
But I, as I've mentioned, in the 1980s, as a head of department in a school teaching about four or five languages, and the teachers never shared what they were doing or the kinds of resources that they were using. And I encouraged them to do so. And it really helped. And they realised that collaboration was much better than competition. So as part of this, um, and in an ECML project called LAX, um, Languages, Asso Language Associations Collaborative Support, we did a big survey. There were 90 language teacher associations across the world uh, from all continents, apart from Antarctica, where I'm not sure if they've got a language teacher association. Um, and uh, we analysed this and put it into this publication, which I'm hoping to, to do another survey next year on this, the 10th anniversary. Um, but really, the, the benefits of collaboration came through, sharing teaching ideas, organising in-service training events together, uh, confer conferences together, not just for French teachers or German teachers, um, representation on policy-making bodies, campaigning to promote language learning, uh, etc. These were all ideas that came out from there about the importance of collaboration. And a few years later, I asked them, um, one of the things that FIPLV has done has been to support uh, language association, teacher associations from separate languages in a country to combine into a multilingual association. And for example, in Latvia, in, in um, Estonia, uh, you know, FIPLV has supported them with that. And Bulgaria has been planning to do the same. So I asked members, I wrote to them, could you, a, a few questions that could help the Bulgarians. And this is just a few, uh, uh, a few of, of them. Sorry, I've just done that one. Um, some advice. Uh, get united in one organisation for the benefit of sharing knowledge, experience and increasing interest towards language learning from Latvia. Finland. It's advisable to build an umbrella organisation, mostly be because it can represent the interests of all language teachers. Easier to talk with public authorities from one association instead of several different ones. Also possible to share costs. And in Estonia, they said that it opened the doors to networks outside Estonia. The members of the Nor Nordic Baltic region of FIPLB as well as FIPLV. Um, and enables them to meet colleagues outside Estonia. So we try to bring the language teacher associations together as well because collaboration is, is far, far more successful um, than, than competition uh, or keeping your ideas to yourselves. And in fact, in an article that I wrote um, uh, uh, some years after I did the survey, I, I um, conceptualised the language teacher associations really as um, spaces for collective autonomy, autonomy because they are helping that autonomously, um, as member associations, finding ways of developing themselves and finding ways of overcoming constraints, just like we've talked about on an individual basis as well. So, um, final slide, I just want to show, well, the final point I want to make is that um, is to invite you to join us um, on the bridge because next year is the FIPLV World Congress in Warsaw, so a bit closer to home for Europe, European uh, colleagues than it's been for the last couple of World Congresses. It's every three years. The last one was in the United States, the one before was in Canada. Um, so please look, FIPLV.com, call for proposals November the 15th. Put it in your diary and we're hoping, so hoping that this will be face to face. And just finish with a reminder that uh, of this poster, Construisons moins de murs, plus de ponts. But also to show you this bridge. And this bridge is actually in Sheffield, my home city, where I am at the moment. Some bridges are very innovative, 
very exciting and think outside the box. This is a bridge from one side of a bridge to another because the bridge, the big bridge is going over the river, but there's a big road there. Um, so this is a bridge bridging a bridge. And with that note, I'd like to say thank you in as many languages as possible. And you've also got some references to everything that I've been presenting. Thank you very much for listening to me today.